Okay, so before we get started, I'll just remind you of a few little disclaimers um, that this is not a private conversation and will eventually be made available to the public and posted online. Um, we want it to be an enjoyable experience for you, so if at any point we get into a, a topic, a line of conversation that you don't want to talk about, just let me know and we'll redirect. Um, if you need to take a break at any point, just let me know that as well. Uh, my role is to actually talk as little as possible and let you tell your story, um, but rest assured that I'm engaged and following along. Um, I might be looking at my notes and taking notes occasionally, uh, but I'm <coughs> actively engaged in the, in the process. So today is Thursday, April 26, 2018. My name is Andy Reisinger, and I am interviewing Alvin Burrell uh, here in the Department of Special Collections and Archives at Georgia State University as part of the Great Speckled Bird Oral History Project. And before beginning, if I can just get your verbal confirmation and consent uh, to be recorded. Yes, you have the consent to record this interview. Excellent. Um, so this is a, a life history, so we want to capture your entire life. So we'll start at the very beginning. If you could tell me a bit about when and where you were born. Well, I, I was born in Atlanta in uh, 1949. My father was a, a graduate student in mathematics at Emory University. And uh, I was, um, we lived in a little area, I believe what's called Mudtown, which is where the Emory Conference Center is today. That was where the married students were housed. Okay. My mother uh, was, uh, was an occasional student uh, at this university. I believe it had another name in 1948 and 49. Mm. She, she was going to school here. And what was the exact date of your birth? August 19th, 1949. Okay. And tell me a bit about, about your parents, their background, where they were from, their families. Um, and then ultimately well, occupation. My, my father and mother met in Atlantic City in 1945 while he was recuperating from uh, injuries he'd suffered in World War II. Uh, he lost both of his legs uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, he was a combat engineer. Um, the, uh, so they, uh, and she was from New Jersey he was from Atlanta, like me. He was born at Grady Hospital, 1925. Um, and they they met, fell in love, and uh, they moved. She when they after they married, she moved to Georgia to, uh, to live with him. Um, she was a New Jersey girl from the Pennsylvania Pens. Her father was a, a Yankee. Uh, her grandfather was a Yankee. Clipper. Her father was an electrician that moved all around New Jersey trying to find jobs during the Depression. She told me a lot of those stories. Uh, she was a, a, a definitely, you know, anti-communist, but a very, very liberal uh, uh, type of uh, Roosevelt Democrat. Mm -hmm. My father was more of a, of a free thinker down here in the South. He told me he felt he was an atheist as an early age and was very troubled by what he saw of Jim Crow activity you know and just well, he was kind of a he was a boys high student uh, a very intellectual at an early age and just uh, a, a critic pretty much of the society so those kind of uh, uh, that philosophy or approach to life both kind of the hard hardcore uh, uh, pro-union northern mother and the free-thinking uh, scientific approached father uh, was the kind of atmosphere I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And what, what were your parents' names? Uh, uh, my father's name was Martin Burrell. My mother, who is still alive at 97, her name is, was uh, Jenny Brown Tallman. And did your father's family have long-standing roots in Atlanta or the South? Actually, yes, they had uh, very long. I mean, I think they came over in the early 1700s or 1600s. I'm not sure. They lived in North Carolina, and then they were part of uh, uh, 
uh, of the uh, Cherokee removal um, from uh, relocation to Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and that's why they settled in Towns County, Georgia, Hiawassee, which is where both of my father's grandparents came from. Okay. My father, my grandfather was a, a decorated World War I veteran, he got a job with the Postal Service and moved to Atlanta after he, after he married, and they, uh, they built a house on the West End, which is where my father grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, were, they were very conservative, um, basically racist, but, uh, but I do remember my grandfather, he worked at the post office, he talked about seeing, I think, uh, Julian Bond, Martin King, Maynard Jackson when they were young men, uh, and he was always very impressed with those particular individuals, mm -hmm. uh, despite his general racist orientation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, I, I mean, I, I, do you want me to go on a little bit about my childhood years? And, uh, yeah, 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 tell me about I, your, I mean, your Well, my father's and... first job in the early 50s, after he graduated from memory with a master's in and mathematics uh, was in at Warner Robins. We lived uh, briefly in Warner Robins. I don't have very very good memories of those years. I was four. When I was four, we moved to Bibb County, which is where I went to elementary school the first three years. There was farms all around us. I remember just seeing a lot of sharecroppers, black and white, uh, and. Um, uh, the kids would go to school bare. The, the sharecropper kids would go to school barefoot, uh, and of course it was totally segregated. But one of the one of the points I've always remembered about there, and again when I uh, lived in Alabama, and uh, and I uh, also when I lived in Sandy Springs a few years later, that we would they would bus us all day long, you know, hours to get to our schools, and we usually in the path of this busing would go by a, a black school. And the, this was just one of the ironies that struck me later when, when, when we went through integration. One of the things that sort of formed my political awareness was all these people were complaining about the horrors of busing children, yet uh, all my life or my formative years through the seventh grade, I was bused past black schools that were closer to me in order to get to my segregated white school. So that was just an early... Uh, this was just a historical fact that I noticed when I, at the time, but later started making me think about questioning what, what the Southern society dominant culture was trying to tell me about things that were happening uh, in my own life. Mm. Part of, and led, you know, led to an early disillusionment. Uh, when I was uh, eight, we moved back to Atlanta when my father was pursuing his aerospace career. Uh, lived in Sandy Springs. And who was he working for pursuing that career? Lockheed. Okay. At that point, he worked for the Air Force initially, Lockheed. Uh, the thing I remember now, I was in Atlanta when uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, when Lester Maddox, uh, you know, when they were the first sit ins, when Lester Maddox handed out. Uh, uh, pick handles at his restaurant. Uh, I remember all the fuss a, about that. I, rem I remember sort of, you know, the, but Georgia had some politicians that also that were more moderate. Um, and I remember my, my father, he, like I said, who was a long time Atlantan, I remember him and my mother having arguments uh, with their friends about integration. And they were usually the only ones that were in favor of it, uh, and you know, I remember people, uh, people, my well, my mother's friends leaving, crying. The women all breaking down and crying. They would get so upset and arguing about it. And I felt, you know, I just felt a little bit like I'm different. I'm the only. Um, I'm part of a very few number of, of white people down here that think maybe there's something wrong with segregation. Mm -hmm. So I was careful. I would, you know, I didn't want to be singled out uh, too much. But still, at the same time, my little mind was thinking. And were these issues? Was integration specifically an oh. issue that would have been 
discussed at school among classmates? Not or so on the much. Bus, on not the so much in the fifth and sixth grade. Mm -hmm. When I moved, when we moved to Alabama, when my father took his job with NASA to work in the space program, um, George Wallace was running for governor for the first time. And what year about was that? This would have been 1961. Mm -hmm. 62, I think, was yeah, the election year we moved. Uh, it was that spring, my first spring. I've just been in, been in uh, Huntsville, Madison County, for about six months when the election started. And yeah, and then it became a very frequent because he made race the issue that he ran on and which he won on. And um, it became something very we were very conscious of uh, through that whole period because they were they were pressing very hard. The civil rights movement was pressing very hard to integrate the schools. The Kennedy administration had gotten involved. I remember Attorney General, I think his name was Katzenbach, came down and forced George Wallace to step aside from the door of the University of Alabama. All that took place. Uh, it, I, I, my mother took me to, I remember, to an Episcopal church, in, in one of the oldest church, I think, in Huntsville. And the minister there, I think he was friends with a lot of the young uh, Freedom Riders. Several young Episcopal priests were part of the Freedom Riders. Um, and he was very passionate in favor of integration and basically he lost about a third of his uh, parishioners because they didn't want to hear that but the church the church stayed on uh, it survived um, it was just a these were just period you know things that really just formed me and kind of solidified the hypocrisy and the hatred that I saw sort of uh, cemented in my mind, you know, my own personal opinions that there are things needed to change in this society and that the dominant Southern culture was wrong. Mm -hmm. I, you know, many of my, uh, my uh, fellow bird people were much more involved, you know, they actually came to Atlanta and joined the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, I was much more uh, passive uh, about it, but my, definitely my opinions were, were set were being formed uh, in favor of wanting to change this society. First civil rights and, and then later the war in Vietnam. I saw a lot of hypocritical parallels mm -hmm. in the way the society organized around that war. Um, the only, the other, th one other uh, early uh, to thing that happened was I, I was in Birmingham for a dog show in 1963 uh, when the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed on that weekend. And the thing that I, I've always, my mother and I always talked about was how tangible the tension, anger, and hatred was in the air. There was people, white people riding around in cars, you know, honking their horns and flashing signs, integration now, never, things like that. And, and, and though we were horrified, I really can't say it. I was surprised when we woke up Sunday morning and heard the sirens and turned on the local TV and saw that a black church had been bombed. So people riding around with these signs and honking would have been on Saturday the day before just right right we were downtown at, at an I think it was an armory in downtown Birmingham but it was on the streets and everywhere there were some uh, yard signs up like political signs mm -hmm. or uh, uh, you know expressing you know opposition to integration and using some of the worst terms you know the n-word was written out and spoken everywhere Those were just, I mean, I, I, they were formative. There was only, in high school, there was a few uh, other people that were sympathetic uh, to uh, integration, to the civil rights movement. We were luckily, you know, tended to be, so, so, all the people that were like that tended to be some of the more intellectual. So the kids didn't argue with us too much, but you had to be careful, you know, 
at Jim <laughs> that you didn't do anything. Or his, I remember or else yeah, face retribution or at yeah, least fear it. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've read other, other accounts of, 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 of black individuals that were in Huntsville actually at the same time. And their accounts don't read exactly like what my memory is, but this is, my memory was that they integrated the schools, I guess it would have been 1964. That was my 10th grade year. Um, and what they brought in was some of the brightest kids, the kids that were probably children of doctors, lawyers, and other, other professionals, CPAs, whatever, uh, university, there, were, you know, there was a, a black university in Huntsville, probably their children. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, you know, our association with them was very, very casual, very, not very deep at all. Uh, the second year, my school, Butler High School, which was also the same school where most of the Army kids went, there was an Army base in Huntsville, part of the Marshall Space Flight Center, Redstone Arsenal. And um, so they brought in, they, we integrate, they, we brought in a lot of the athletes, which was great. Because <laughs> we, all of a sudden, our school uh, was the first time we, we won our district football championship and we actually won the state basketball championship. What was uh, interesting, we had one, one uh, we had a couple uh, black students that played on the basketball, boys basketball team. But one of them in particular was a, was a very good athlete, Danny Treadwell. Along with our own, our own senior, uh, uh, what was his, Randy Hollingsworth, who was all, already, he himself was an exceptional player. The two of them, you know, were able to beat the big teams from Mobile, Tuscaloosa, and Birmingham. They, they said that he was, he was jeered, uh, Danny Treadwell, our black athlete, when he first ended up stepped onto the floor in the state tournament. But they said he got a standing ovation. I wasn't at that game uh, when we won the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was somewhat reassuring. Uh, but Danny was never, <laughs> never able to get a scholarship to play basketball. So I don't, we, I don't know where they went, whatever happened to him. But I remember there was an editorial in the paper mentioning that. And once again, it struck me there was uh, injustice here. In growing up, in Warner Robins and then Sandy Springs and your dad's affiliation work at Lockheed and then in Huntsville for the space program. What do you recall of the sort of composition of your dad's co-workers as well as did you go to school with the children of people that your dad would have worked with? Um, some, and did those people primarily tend to come from the South, or was it? Did these entities attract workers from around the country that were coming for a very specialized line of work? Actually, you you make a you make a, a very interesting point. I I I don't know what you know. Even though I, I have a bachelor's degree in sociology. I don't know exactly what the makeup was, but I, you know, even as a very young child, I lived in what could be called uh, subdivision type areas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, educated, uh, professional type uh, Southerners. Uh, and a lot of them at least had one, the husband or the wife was from another area. And especially when we got to uh, Sandy Springs, you know, almost everybody was from somewhere else. If, if not another town in the South, it, a lot of them were from the Midwest and the North. Mm -hmm. it's very cur it was very interesting to me because even though these people were from other areas, most of them held very conservative ideas. Now, I don't know whether it was because of the class they were from or or because they chose to move south because they felt comfortable moving to an area where, with the south's Jim Crow reputation. Maybe they wanted to be in an area where they were segregated. I don't know. I, you know, I haven't. Seen, I don't really know what the actual data would show on that. But I did experience that. That there was a lot of people from not from the south, but that also 
held, for the most part, fairly conservative, at least social, political aspects. Now, they were they tend to be pro-education, um, and they tended to begrudgingly embrace evolution and other scientific uh, aspects. But they were uh, there was a lot of clinging. Again, once again, I'm going back to the racial issue, which mm -hmm. you know formed you know just influence. It was just overwhelming presence in Southern culture of the idea of separate but equal, that, and, and that, that somehow, even though they knew there was no scientific evidence to back it, that, you know, that it had pretty much been dismissed, that somehow the black race was in some way inferior. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my, like my father, again, like, like my mother, he was, he always thought that was a joke, and he a lot of times his approach was just to dismiss it on, on scientific and pre prejudicial basis. You know, he he often uh, and I do. It, it is interesting that the only friends he had that really were supportive of him were his Jewish friends. There were a lot of you know a lot of a lot of Jewish mathematicians and scientists, and they were they tend to be racially progressive, even politically. Most of the rest of the guys were were pretty hardcore right wingers uh, for most for most things political. Um, on that. And how did how did your father experience navigate? live with his disability. Um, That's inter well, I mean, I, there, he, he's got a whole story. <laughs> he's yeah. got a whole story of his own. He was, a, a, it was, it, most of the men that he was in rehabilitation with never rejoined mainstream society. Most of them took their pension. Most of the men that lost two legs took their pensions and uh, lived very quiet lives at home. Some of them he was one of the few, uh, and as a matter of fact, when we would go up to New Jersey for my mother's reunions, he would always go over to the VA hospital. This was in the 60s, uh, in, all through the 60s, and visit his friends that were, some of them were still living in the hospital. Uh, that he had been with, uh, but he, but he, you know, he just took a very positive attitude. My mother, when she wrote after he, he had passed away, that part of the reason she fell in love with him was because he was so positive and eager and excited uh, to do things. I, I mean, one of the things that, you know, there's, I've got two or three little articles that they, they wrote about him when he was at Emory. One of them was how he had somehow helped uh, edit or write documents for the, when the UN was forming. There, I, evidently they were doing that somewhere uh, near uh, Atlantic City. Uh, he was always engaged in those kind of things. Uh, anyway, he was very positive. The, the Veterans Administration used him as kind of a spokesman for a while for uh, World War II veterans that had disabilities that to re-engage in life and be, you know, be get involved and, and you know, make, you know, get beyond their handicaps and their injuries. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but he was, but anyway, the other thing that I would say was he was treated with great deference, probably unlike some of our, some of the veterans from the Vietnam War or even the Gulf War. I mean, people would open doors for him. They, a lot of the other men that had served in the Army were incredibly respectful uh, of the World War II veterans that were injured uh, like him. Uh, there was always deference to him. They might, you know, get mad and yell about other things, you know, if they thought somebody else offended them with their political liberalism, but they would never, at that period of time, nobody would ever be disrespectful to him. Mm -hmm. So he, he kind of lived a little bit of a charmed life in that respect. Uh, I remember one of our neighbors, we lived in a, they, they always wanted to live out in the country, which was not great for me. I mean, I wanted to be in a town where I could be in a subdivision with other kids. But they moved, they moved up on this mountain uh, outside of Huntsville, 
where I guess I lived eight through the twelfth grade. Um, and I remember one of our neighbors who was, you know, extremely racist. Uh, they tried to recruit my father to come to a Klan meeting. Uh, and I remember him just making up some excuse and he telling me as we drove away in the car, they, we had met them down the street. They had, he said, you know, don't ever hang out with those people. He said, they're, they're really a bad bunch. Mm -hmm. He was always real proud. When they start, when the, when NASA integrated, at least you know, uh, I never heard anything about the hidden figures women. I don't remember. I I, I guess I'm sorry he he's gone that he can't. I'm sure he knew something about them, but um, the uh, but he was always one of the first people to bring on new hires uh, from the black uh, hires. He always said. And he always smiled and said, these guys work twice as hard as the white kids. I'm getting a better deal. <laughs> and, it, and he just said, you know, it, it makes sense. Um, once again, he always tried to be, he tried to justify what he did rationally. Mm -hmm. my, my mother was just a firebrand. She would get angry and yell at people and, and you know, kind of made herself, a, at times, a little bit of a, an outcast, I guess, because she would sometimes get carried away. But two things she did that that also influenced me was she got me involved uh, twice in, in getting people to sign petitions. These were non-racial issues. She just I, one initially she wanted um, she wanted to get uh, public. Uh, she wanted to get city water from the little town of Madison, which is outside of Huntsville, to our house. So we, we, we not, she had me go out with her, and maybe she had a neighbor or two that was also in favor of it. And so I would just was going door to door, walking down these rural roads. This was not this was not this was not truly a subdivision area. It was a long country road. Where I would you'd be 500 feet between houses. And then again, uh, she decided that that wasn't enough. That she actually wanted to be annexed into the town of uh, Madison. So I think we got the city water. Uh, I don't think people wanted to be annexed into the city. Mm -hmm. and people always push back against taxes. Mm -hmm. But I'm, at an early age, she got me involved in, demo in, the, in the sense of, you know, in sense of democracy and public participation to uh, try and get uh, government to, to, to be helpful. And did she work outside the home? No, she had a teaching degree from Mercer, which she got, which she finally completed she, uh, when, when we were living in, outside of Macon in Bibb County. Mm -hmm. uh, but she never, uh, never held a, a paying job. She did a lot of volunteer work uh, with the, uh, I, forget what, I forget what they called it, but it was for uh, mentally, hand, mentally handicapped or uh, children at the time. My brother had dyslexia. And so she got heavily involved in that. And so you have one one brother, one brother and one sister. They're twins. They were born in '57. They were so eight years school eight school years behind me. They were almost like a nephew and niece, mm -hmm. as much as a brother and sister. Though you know, once once we became adults years later, we kind of uh, worked out the, a more equal relationship. And back to your your dad and and his handicap. Did was he in a wheelchair or could he get uh, around on crutches? Yeah, well, he he, he was uh, he he did have a wheelchair, and a lot of times he, his legs would get too sore and he couldn't walk mm -hmm. for weeks at a time. But no, he had wooden legs, so he was very determined. You know, he he did presentations in England and Germany, scientific presentations back in the sixties traveled all around the country uh, going to these you know, mathematic, mathematical conventions doing his work. He was very proud of his work and his participation mm -hmm. in the space program. One, another, another story I always tell about him, I, I didn't realize it at the time, now I realize it, how it's a little bit more rare, but he was always just loved to go to work when those years he was working uh, on the moon project. I mean, he would literally get up in the morning singing and talk about the new tests they were going to run and the new supercomputer they got down at the at the uh, at the NASA uh, office, you know, and 
he was just, it was really a great period for him, very exciting. And I was infected by that part of it, but you know, I was a typical high school kid that wasn't so thrilled to be up at 6 a.m. thinking about spending a day at school. Yeah. And so what were some of your, your interests and hobbies as, as a youth? Well, I, I, I was I was kind of a I was kind of a little bit of a, of a introvert uh, person. I, I really did. After we, you know, I, the the few period, the five years I lived in subdivisions, the you know, as a child here in Sandy Springs, and then the one the first year before they built the house way up on the on Rainbow Mountain. Um, I was I loved being in the in the neighborhood with lots of kids, but once I got up there from the eighth grade through the twelfth grade, uh, I really had nobody close by. My closest friends were ten or twelve miles away. So I, I and so and then I really didn't start driving until I was a senior in high school. So I spent a lot of time uh, just reading. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a, they did put me in a, it was just an incredibly beautiful. I don't know how you know. I mean, there you could walk all day to get from my side of the mountain to the other side of the mountain. Um, so I would spend my weekends just walking in the woods there. I was active in the scouts uh, too, uh, and that was about it. I mean, I was in school. I was initially a very good student in things like uh, language and, and math. And toward the later years, I wasn't I wasn't that good good enough to get into college. Um, I, w I worked for the newspaper, the school newspaper. I was the news editor. Okay. So I guess that sort of set me uh, mm -hmm. into a, a little bit of a, of a, laid some of the groundwork for me being interested in working for the Great Speckled Bird mm -hmm. later, later on. Um, and how many years did you work on the paper? Was in the that school all? paper, two mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Two years. I was, like, I was news editor both years and uh, it was, you know, very exciting for me because I did get to, you know, I got to supervise other people and plan articles and, uh, you know, decide what was going to be in the paper, uh, at least with regards to news. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, that was a real good, real strong formative uh, experience for me. And did you do writing as well as, as an editor? When I had to. At that point, uh, you know, I, I, I really didn't have to worry about that. I was, I, I guess, I, you know, I was, I was one of the people in the honors English class. And I, so I, I you know, I, it was assumed I could write. Uh, so my, my a close friend of mine was, he was one of the brightest kids in the school. And uh, he had just offered me the job, I guess, because he liked me. I had gone to a middle school with him. We would, we'd gone to this private school together um, in Huntsville, which was, uh, I had a very accelerated uh, learning program. So I guess that's, I guess that's why he hired me. Mm -hmm. Some, somebody told me he went on to Lawrence Livermore Labs and had 16 patents his name or something. <laughs> but he never came back to the high school reunion, so I don't know for sure. Okay. And you mentioned reading a lot. What what sort of things oh, did you gravitate to? Novels, uh, science books. and stuff. Yeah, my, my mother always had all kinds of magazines coming in. I, mean, I remember reading, reading uh, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X, and I think it was in Life magazine. Or, you know, he was at least part of it was published there. I remember reading about um, the the Globe Theater. I remember reading. My father would give me things like Bertrand Russell to read, uh, you know, and, and different history books. Uh, but also, I read a lot of the great classics: you know, mm -hmm. Steinbeck, uh, Theodore Dreiser, uh, just everything. My father had, you know, he had, you know, like like a lot of people from that from that period. He had a, Big library full of everything, mm -hmm. including uh, the Kinsey Report, <laughs> which I found very interesting during my middle school years. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, like I said, it was it was pretty much uh, uh, for the most part uh, fairly uh, 
withdrawn. I got I, I was more social, uh, sociable in in, in uh, my senior year. And you mentioned some sort of how racial issues and integration were this the formative experience of growing growing up uh, mm -hmm. at, at this critical moment in time, particularly here in the South. Um, are there other events or particular people um, that were influential in your life? Yes, I, well I'm, I mean on the national figure Muhammad Ali particularly struck me as a, as a very sympathetic figure and to some extent Malcolm X. I heard both, I mean, everybody was telling me how terrible these two individuals were. Uh, but I listened to them, but they were on TV. They were writing, you know, they were writing articles and being quoted in newspapers and magazines. And the things they said were not at all where they were being portrayed. Fake news, as you might call it. Um, uh, and uh, I, I found them, you know, I was... Um, I loved them. I, for some reason, I loved boxing. I guess because I wasn't very athletic, uh, I could really relate to uh, boxing as an individual. It was just one one person against another person, and and I just you know, and I guess just because of my own rebellious nature, I immediately took to uh, Muhammad Ali and his poem writing and, and smart mouth, and, and and everybody was telling me how terrible he was, but I listened to him and exactly what he said, and I didn't find him anything but just incredibly honest. Same thing with Malcolm X. Everybody told me, everybody at school was talking about how he was trying to lead the black race up to try and, uh, you know, kill all the white people. And I said, no, that's not what he says at all. He just says, if I'm attacked, I reserve the right to de defend myself, you know. And he told, you know, the brutal honest truth about what Jim Crow and slavery had done to the black people. I mean, I was just a kid, you know. All I was doing was just trying to be reasonable, trying to find the truth, as my father told me, you know. Put away your passions and anger and just try to be dispassionately and find the truth, and it was just there. I, I remember the march on Selma, I remember, <laughs> and I think it was after the people were beat up on the bridge, I think it was Martin King, maybe Ralph Abernathy, asked everybody to come to Selma. And I remember begging my mother to take us to Selma. It would have only been a hundred mile drive for us. And and she was just saying, No, you go to school, you know, I've got you've got to go to school. I have two little children. But she sympathized with me. She was very upset too. Mm -hmm. And were you aware, uh, interested in the different music and art um, of the, the yeah. period? Oh, cool. films? Well, of course. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I was into uh, rock music, and, and it was so funny in the South. I mean, uh, I had a lot of friends that were in the school band, that were in the jazz band. Uh, several of them st kept their career in music, uh, actually, of my high school. Friends and uh, how much they were into soul music and black influence music. I was, um, when I was a freshman, I remember the day we woke up, uh, I think it was on a Saturday morning, maybe it was a Sunday morning, and we learned, and we learned that uh, Otis Redding had been killed in a plane crash along with his, uh, his band. Um, and uh, how, how upset my friends were. But all these guys were, you know, they weren't hard racist, but they were, you know, they weren't r real thrilled about it all either. It was, it was always ironic how much the black kid, the white kids in the South loved the black music, mm -hmm. um, but didn't embrace the whole culture. Another irony that, that struck me later. But yeah, I was into that. I, I, was, I was rebellious uh, in my own quiet way. Uh, even even uh, in high school. When uh, the last thing I wanted to say, you know, the, the war in Vietnam initially, I, I always believed in freedom of speech, so I wasn't trying to shut 
any of those early protesters down. Uh, but I, I was pretty much pro-Vietnam War because I thought, saw it as a threat. Uh, and also I had this, you know, my father and of course my uncles and many of the fathers of my contemporaries had fought in World War uh, II. Uh, my grandfather and my, both of my grandfathers were World War I veterans and I felt it, probably, it might be my turn to go fight in the war. And one thing that my father said to me, that I, and I'm not quoting him exactly, I'm afraid I didn't, I didn't write it down, but he asked me uh, what college I was going to in the fall of my senior year, and I said, I really had, I told him I was sick of studying, and I thought I would just take a job uh, for a year, maybe get a training as a medical technician, and, and go into the Army when I got drafted. At that point, in 1966, 67, generally, uh, boys that were 1A, and I definitely would have been uh, 1A draft uh, status, uh, were uh, drafted around your 19th birthday. They, they didn't really take you that first year. Like my father was not, I think he was notified that he was drafted even before he uh, graduated from high school or more too. But the, uh, and he just looked at me and he just said, no, he said. And, he, and, he, and I always remember he said, you know, the first time, it was one of the few times I ever heard him complain or act sorry for himself, he said, Every day I have to get up and strap on these wooden legs. I, I, you know, I've always felt that it was worth it because I was fighting the worst tyrant of the 20th century, Adolf Hitler. But, but he said, I have to, have to ask myself, was it really worth it? Was there another way to do this, to you know, preserve freedom? And he said, you're not going to go get killed or injured fighting in this stupid Vietnam War. It makes no sense at all. And he had really hadn't said much about the war. I did notice, notice that he was reading books by Eugene McCarthy, but uh, who, I don't know if you know who he was, but he, was, he ran against uh, Lyndon Johnson mm -hmm. in 1968 along with Robert Kennedy. Uh, so I, I, and he just said, You're, I, I know you can get into the University of Tennessee. I have friends there and we'll make sure you get in. So I did. And growing up, you're the your father's parents, like when you're living in Warner Robins and then and then in Huntsville, um, his parents are still here in Atlanta. Uh, they moved, I think, '56 or '57. They retired. My grandfather retired, and they moved back to Claremont. Okay. They were part of the early wave of white flight, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I didn't hear, you know, other than the fact that they were both tended generally racist, but they weren't like rabid, they, you know, my grandfather would never have been part of anything like the Klan. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, he, like I said, and even though, you know, he, I think he felt black people were inferior, he would never have uh, shamed himself by doing something violent or unlawful. Uh, I guess that's kind of where he always said, we're, we're burrows, we're good stock, we don't, we don't contribute to we don't participate in mob violence, you know. That was it. I don't know. He just had a, per a sense of personal integrity. Uh, and prior to, to integration, which you experienced in 10th grade, I think? Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. Um, did you, as a child, did your family have much interaction with black folks? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, especially in um, in rural in in the Macon Warner Robins area, mm -hmm. we were very close to black people. In the in and, 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 well, they were well, they were sh uh, sharecroppers. They were fit, and we had we had maids. Mother yeah. always had a maid. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll tell you another story. So yeah. well, uh, I guess I was five or six years old, and, and mother had. Uh, uh, a very reliable maid. She actually lived, we could, her house was backyard, there was a cotton field between her house and our house and then my, my parents had a small garden and uh, and she would come and take care of me. I guess mother, mother was probably going to Mercer, probably studying, uh, finishing up her college degree 
and the, and the maid would come and take care of me and keep house. And, uh, and I remember one day she, a friend of hers came by in a car and she was out there. Uh, and she walked out and had this, what seemed to me a very long conversation and she came back. And I don't know where this came up in my little squirmy four or five year old brain, but I, I proceeded to lecture her on talking to her friends when she was supposed to be working at the house for my mother. And I remember her turning on me and just, you know, wagging her finger at me and saying, you're just a little boy, you know, and I'm a full-grown woman. You don't ever tell me uh, what I should or shouldn't be doing. And, uh, and I, th I think she felt confident in doing that because she knew my mother would have uh, backed her totally in that. So it just was a, and it, but it made an, imp it made an impression on me very early that Black people, despite what everybody else was telling me, needed to be respected. Mm -hmm. And that stayed with me a long time. And so throughout your, yeah, your yeah. childhood, your when mom we, when we had... came When we came to Atlanta, we had maids too. I remember the, now that, that she, I mean, I've heard other, when I went on the civil rights tour with Tom Houck, uh, a few weeks ago, he just talked about, uh, where the women would assemble to uh, to go uh, to the northern suburbs uh, to take the buses and stuff, and uh, we had we I remember the woman she was always extremely well dressed. She did a very good job on the house, you, you know, and then she but I just remember the dignity with which she would come and put her maid clothes on, but she always dressed up very well, like she was going to Sunday school uh, to go home. It was very important for her that she came and left uh, with dignity. Mm -hmm. There weren't any issues uh, with her. I just, I, I just know my mother uh, said that she got the, this, and I don't remember her name either, uh, but she said that she was the best maid uh, in the area and that she, she was able to get her because she uh, always paid her in cash where a lot of the other uh, women would, at their own whim, just decide to give them old clothes or give their mates old clothes or some groceries instead That's of pain. cash. So my mother would, would sometimes do that stuff too, but it was a bonus. She always paid her uh, an agreed upon salary. And mother was very proud that she did that. It wasn't just, you know, made a point of letting me know that she uh, treated black people with respect. It, I mean, it was, it's, you know, it's, it's terrible when you think about it now. We were, we were, it was almost like an evolution of consciousness that I grew up in. And so you graduated high school in 67? Yes. Um, and based on your, your father's staunch guidance, <laughs> did go directly to college. And um, you know, you probably know you did, there were student deferments, four year student deferments available at that time. So as long as I kept um, a certain level of academic progress, I would have a, at least a four year deferment mm -hmm. from the military. And so you, you move off to Knoxville. Right. Um, and into a dorm. Yes. Yeah. It was wonderful. I mean, I was an out-of-state student, big state university. Mm -hmm. Tuition was five, well, $500 a semester. So I, I got a, you know, a full year <laughs> education for $1,500 at a major state university. Yeah. I feel so sorry for the kid, my own kid, uh, today. So yeah, I went there, and um, very big school. I was totally lost. You know, I would have. I, I realize now, I probably would have been better adjusted at a at a smaller school. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, it's where I was. It was it was very big, very exciting. Um, 
And the first thing I remember happening was there was, a, there was the march on the Pentagon, if you're familiar at all with the anti-war movement in the 1960s. And that sort of caught my, you know, that's kind of interesting, you know, and uh, I thought it was real cute, the, the girls putting the flowers in the, in the soldiers' uh, rifle barrels. And uh, what else was going on? I don't know. There was just, you know, I, I got involved with dorm politics. I got, was my, I got elected president on my dorm floor. And uh, which was it, then, which got me down to meet uh, with uh, other other dorm floor players. It was all it was an all boys floor. Uh, and um, were there any co-ed floors at this? Well, point? The, the 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 biggest thing they had. I was in the I was in the newest uh, dormitory complex. It was a a three. It was a quad with a, a cafeteria, a recreation area on one side. Boys dorm, girls dorm across the other square, and then there was a an integrated dorm, but there was, it was a strict wall between. Them. I, I just I just ran just two weeks ago. A woman that's working on a local uh, tree ordinance with me in the city of Decatur. She actually was there at the same time as me. Uh, she was from Chattanooga, and she brought up to me that when she, when we entered there, girls had hours, women had hours. Mm -hmm. They had curfew at eleven o'clock, maybe midnight on the weekend. And in my second or third year there, the, the women staged a, a walkout every night until that was dropped. The, I, I, get, I don't know if they still use the term for college today, in local parentis. But anyway, uh, I don't, if it is, it isn't that form. It isn't the exercise yeah. in that form. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Uh, and one of the things that happened there was there was, there was a young, a young, a very progressive kid from... Uh, from Brooklyn, there named uh, Je uh, what was it? Goldstein, Jeff Goldstein, Ken, Gold Ken Goldstein, and he—I don't know why he picked up, but he wanted yeah, to form Brooklyn. a speaker. <laughs> he wanted to form a speaker's organization and bring in somebody uh, from some speaker from the administration or the city of Knoxville to speak every—I think it was every Sunday afternoon. And so I joined that. We called it ID, IDEX, Idea Exchange. And uh, so that, that got me involved with civic activities and discussions and that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things that, and I don't know whether any of my bird friends were at Columbia uh, when they had the big student revolt there in the spring of 68. Yeah, just the 50th anniversary. So you're, you're familiar, yeah, when I see somebody yeah. younger than me, I never know, how, but I guess you're a historian, so you're probably tuned in a little, a little bit more, but. Uh, but one of the uh, one of the uh, graduate students, graduate instructors in the history department, had a friend that was uh, at Columbia, another grad student there, and his friend was calling him uh, like daily to tell him about what was happening. So this guy had been this was about two weeks into it, and this young uh, graduate instructor came showed up. And, and told us every, you know, he just was reading down the notes he'd taken. And it, he was so glad to have somebody that he could, that he could t tell about it with. It was on the news, but here was a first-hand account in our program, did it. But a lot, of the, a lot of the big issues back then on campus were, of course, you know, women's curfews, uh, integration, which was pretty new there at the University of Tennessee. We had a small, we had a small group of, of black students that felt very isolated and pretty much discriminated against. Uh, they formed a black students union. Um, and, uh, oh, in freedom and the, and the free speech policy. Mm -hmm. We are, uh, the year before in 1966, before I went there, they, uh, they had, re the administration had not allowed some student group to bring uh, uh, Dick Gregory onto campus because they considered him way too controversial. And it was so funny because another, the, the administration themselves turned around and invited Julian Bond uh, to speak. And he refused on the grounds that if you, can, if you don't want to hear Dick Gregory speak, you don't want to hear me speak either. And it, made a, it embarrassed the university and it pretty much, we got things broke, broken down so that there were no longer any censor, you know, administrative censorship of, of student speaking programs, and that, that was a, it was a real interesting 
I was not involved in that in any way. Uh, I was you know, just my freshman, uh, first quarter freshman, but uh, still it was something that I, I noticed and was thoroughly uh, delighted by that development. I got, um, I guess my, I guess it was my, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Eugene McCarthy ran against uh, um, uh, Lyndon Johnson for pres in the presidential, Democratic presidential primaries in the winter of 68. He, I think he either, I don't know if he won or he just got a very good showing, but it was the, 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 Demo the resistance in the, to the war in Vietnam had grown to the point where the Democratic Party was really already being divided. Now, I, I grew up, my mother, my mother was a, a Kennedy uh, lover, and, and when Robert Kennedy declared, I could decide I'm going to campaign for Robert Kennedy. And uh, so I, I, worked on, I worked on that, uh, met a lot of kids there that were, had a lot of ideas. And, and, and suddenly, and just gradually became very skeptical about the war in Vietnam. And uh, so that, that was, uh, and when he got killed, you know, I, I sort of just sort of dropped out for a while. Um, I remember going back to, um, to uh, Huntsville for the summer and going to the beach with my friends when the uh, Democratic Convention was held. In, Chicago. It was the same week we were at the beach, and I, you know, I became just hysterical because several people I knew had decided to go to the Democratic convention, and of course, when all the stuff broke loose, you know, I, I just was. <laughs> I'll never forgive myself for going to the beach, but <laughs> even that <laughs> fifty years later. <laughs> but uh, the uh, just seeing that was pretty much it for me. What had happened there, and of course, when I got back to campus that fall, all the kids were starting to grow their hair. This was a southern you know, grow buying bell bottoms, you know, getting uh, fists on their, uh, get buying buttons with fists and all this. And I, and actually, there all along there had been a fairly uh, radical faction in the campus that I had really not, mainly graduate students. Um, mm -hmm. But they came back, and I became familiar, familiar with some of those. One of my one of my mentors was a uh, a guy that I'd met on the Kennedy campaign. Was uh, he was in his early twenties, maybe, maybe mid twenties. He had he was a graduate student. I forget what, maybe social work. I have no idea now. Uh, but he had been in the Vista. He had been in Vista for two years, and he had a lot of ideas about poverty. He got me involved in working at this center that was run by the War on Poverty and partially staffed by Vista workers. Uh, that I, I worked there for three summers, uh, that first summer of 68, partially before I went home. And then the, next, the third summer I was actually the, the staff director at one, of the, at one of the centers in a poor white neighborhood. In Knoxville. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't believe what we did. It was me and this other woman who was the same age as me. We were both, we were both under 21 that third year. And uh, we would go over to, they, they gave us the keys to an elementary school in this neighborhood. And we just, just the two of us would open up the school. Uh, we mainly had, we, I think part of the school was closed off to us. We had access to the gym and restrooms. And they gave us certain, you know, things to play with. And there were kids coming in four years old. There was kids coming in probably that were almost as old as us, <laughs> neighborhood young, young neighborhood people, that to use that gym, and we just ran it. And you know, only once did anybody get hurt. Two boys got in a fight in the restroom, uh, but nothing ever. And I don't think you know. I mean, today, I mean, I just think you know, uh, uh, you know, sexual molestation. But I don't, to my knowledge, nothing like that ever happened. And we pulled it off. Mm. Uh, it was a it was a great experience for me. I really saw I learned a certain a certain empathy, which I really hadn't had that much for for poor whites. The children were just and the children were just so uh, affectionate, you know, so glad to have uh, a positive adults uh, that showed an interest in. I still wonder what happened to some of those kids. 
don't remember any of their names, but I sure remember their faces. And you all would sort of run a day program yeah. for them yeah, all summer long. Yeah, they would. They would bring in. You know, that it was before food stamps. They would bring in what they call it surplus food, mm. some sort of mystery meat, block cheese, and stale bread and milk. Sometimes there, there was fruit. And when you had volunteered on the, the Kennedy campaign, what sort of work were you doing well, with that? Well, primarily we just, we just took turns operating uh, two local uh, campaign offices, just staffing the office. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't remember if I did some phone calls or we would go downtown and try to pass out brochures. Back at that time, you know, you could still be a liberal Democrat. It wasn't, you, you know, at least in the urban areas, you know, you could, you wouldn't be just run out of town <laughs> for showing up. And then we, we did, a, we did, we went and campaigned in Indiana uh, uh, before even, I remember working, and that was a, a lot of fun. We just went door to door in, uh, I believe it was Columbus, Indiana. And it was on that trip that I bonded with, uh, dozen or so people on the bus. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them became uh, lifelong friends, a handful of them. And of course that year you have the assassination of, of Martin Luther King, King and yeah. Robert yeah. Kennedy and the Democratic Convention. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean King, when King got killed, we, we were, I was afraid, you know, of for what would justifiably happen, which was people were going to riot, people by people rioted, because uh, there had already been a few other riots in cities up north. But I, you know, I never, nobody ever threatened me. I don't know, so it, that fear, you know, uh, wasn't realized. I did, did I did get involved. Over I, the, the campus, the Poor People's March was organ was there and organizers, and I didn't really do anything other than show up at some of their rallies. That was some, that was my first uh, civil uh, act, action for uh, uh, civil rights causes, you know. And um, I remember just, I remember going to the Poor People's Encampment in Washington later that summer being there. Later that, the next year, my sophomore year, there, the, some of the local uh, black activists recruited amongst the white radicals. And I did do some uh, uh, petitioning, what do you call it? We're walking outside, uh, picket lines outside one of the local grocery stores. And, it, and once again, you know, I mean, it just was, I felt pretty vulnerable. As a as a liberal white, uh, in a very racist, very agitated, uh, much like today, the some of the conservatives, uh, right wingers were, were threatening, frightening. But here I was marching on this picket line. You know, uh, maybe four or five white kids and twenty five or thirty black people, and this guy in his pickup truck was old rough looking guy. You know, he comes char he gets in his pickup truck and charges straight at us and the person he comes closest to, he doesn't I don't know if he would have hit us or not. We the the, the, the line broke and he eventually didn't you know he could have run us over but he didn't. I mean once we broke our line. But the person he went straight at was a black woman who was pushing a roller a a, a, a child in a stroller. And once again, you know I mean, 50 years later, I think, oh, so maybe that's a little bit of what white privilege is about. I don't know. <laughs> I just said, you know, why would he go for the woman in the stroller? I, I don't know. Yeah. No. So anyway, I, I just, that, that, that was uh, another little thing that just sort of clicked in my mind. It was a lot of fun. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the anti-war movement, it was very, it was a lot of creative energy, uh, a lot of artistic expression amongst the people. I mean, you, you know, we, we never had an SDS 
uh, at the University of Tennessee, at least during those years. And I don't know uh, a lot, I think, I know some of my other uh, bird uh, colleagues were active in the Southern Student Organizing Committee. Uh, and that had been actually uh, uh, on campus. Like I said, it was kind of a little more underground, quiet group of, of um, primarily upperclassmen and graduate students. Uh, but they were very bitter when the SDS, and I don't really know the, all the story of, of how that came down, but the SDS came down and broke up SOC, mm -hmm. was my understanding for uh, you know, political reasons. And they were very bitter, so the SDS could ne itself, proper, could never get started at our campus. So it was just a bunch of an ad hoc uh, uh, various uh, groups, we, we, you know, little rallies were held and different, different things uh, happened. Uh, when there was marches in Atlanta, uh, you know, they would usually organize a bus to go. And did you attend yeah, any of those? Yeah, 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 I, I would go on bus rides. Now, I'll tell you a little bit, a little bit later. Well, I mean, I'm trying to think what else happened that year. Not much. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My 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 junior beginning of my junior year, they had they held the lottery, the draft lottery. I got a high number, so I got out of jail free. Uh, and they were they were organizing on campus for a, I guess it was called the mobilization. It was a big uh, anti-war group. Uh, a lot of people criticized it because it was. Uh, heavily influenced by the Socialist Workers Party, but I, I don't think it completely controlled it. And it was just a big, the, the main emphasis was just mass turnout, nonviolent, non, uh, but, but just, you know, and just one, one demand, end the war now. I mean, they didn't get into any of the other complicated stuff. And there was a big march in Washington. I think it was the biggest anti-war march in the November of 1969. It was just a few months after Woodstock, and uh, there was just a lot of that, uh, I don't know, just a big, uh, any, uh, we're, we're, a, we're a nation within a nation type feeling. So I remember, yeah, I, I, went, I went on that, I met, uh, I met some other uh, people there. Uh, and, was there uh, a large contingent from Knoxville? I think we had three buses from Knoxville. Okay. Which is a pretty big group. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just huge. I mean, it, I, I, I mean, I remember getting there and, you know, and, and initially they had a sign for every, uh, every uh, uh, soldier that had died at that point. I think at that point there was maybe 20,000, 30,000 that died. And then they started out handing signs of Villages that had in Vietnam, so I got a sign of a village, and I just remember walking for hours and hours. It seemed like you know, we went by the White House, and I, I held up the name of my town, and we put it in a coffin. I you know, we spent the night in a in a little. It was some campaign headquarters. A lot of people spent nights in churches. It was just. It was very very cold. The next day, there was a big rally at the Washington Monument. I remember Peter, Paul, and Mary, Pete Seeger, Seeger. Uh, Bob Dylan, I'm pretty sure, did not come. <laughs> and, but anyway, there was a lot, a lot of people there. Uh, uh, there were several you know, key black speakers. I, uh, I don't remember who that, maybe Jesse Jackson showed up. So it was kind of a transformative movement for me, moment for me. But I came back and dropped out for, <laughs> dropped out for a, uh, a quarter because I was just I would, like I I never really got sick of, of school from my high school years, and I needed a break and mm -hmm. I had an excuse. But I came back. I came right while I was gone. The, the very January gone, there was some some sort of student protest up on the in front of the administration building, and 22 people were beaten and arrested. Uh, they, were, they became the Knoxville 22. And uh, I missed all of that. But I came back 
Do you remember what the, the crux of the, the protest was about? I don't know. There were, there were a list of demands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. We, we had freedom, you know, we had the freedom of speech. So I really don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, probably, we probably wanted students on, probably on, on certain, uh, we probably wanted a peace studies program. I'm just thinking, uh, mm -hmm. maybe more student participation in, uh, in, in course selection or whatever. I, uh, uh, probably the usual list of whatever we were on the, st on the campus activities. Not accepting defense. Department of there Defense you go. Yeah, I'm shut down yeah. the ROTC. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that that would have been one. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I you know so well, when I came, and were you in Huntsville? Yes, I was in Huntsville for three months, three very long months. And what was your parents and possibly your younger siblings' response at this time to? Were they aware that you were involved in some of these political activities and going yeah, to my marches? Father, oh, yeah, my father, I don't know who it was, if it was the FBI or NSA, he was interviewed, he, he was twice questioned because he had a top, he had a, a security clearance, I don't know what, what level it was, but they were concerned uh, and they, the, the reports of my activity, you know, we were observed, and I was, you know, I'm, this might, it might have been, a, might have been later with the part I, I want to tell you about next after I came back. I, that's when I became truly uh, involved. But uh, yeah, and they, they asked him, and, he, and once again, he just said, you know, my son's just exercising his constitutional rights as an American. I don't think you have anything to worry about. You know, he just. <laughs> He just, you know, he doesn't. He didn't do stupid, mm -hmm. <laughs> he, and he had very little. And he was generally a very kindly, uh, soft-spoken person. But he, he just really didn't care for stupid, and that's kind of what he thought. A lot of the reaction to the students was, you know. So let's take a break now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're coming back after, after a nice break and some side conversations. Uh, but when we stopped, we were, uh, you were talking about having taken a quarter off. Um, and to catch go, my breath. Yeah, and going back home. And so then you're returning up to, to school at Knoxville in, for spring 1969? Yes. Oh, this would have been spring of 1970. Now. Okay, spring seven. Spring of 1970. And uh, I get back up there, and I'm just looking around and wondering what all I had missed with the uh, with the small riot and arrest of 22 of my fellow students. Uh, and who should um, who should show up but uh, the uh, a YSA organizer? And uh, he recruits me and a couple other near do wells uh, to start a little chapter there. Uh, and uh, that's Young Socialists of America, which was a kind of a youth wing of the Socialist Workers Party. And I, you know, I really wanted to be in SOC or SDS, but none of, that was not that was not an option. So I figured, well, this is something. I'm ready to go hardcore, learn a little bit about socialism and really changing America, making a revolution. And what were you studying in college? Oh, I'm sorry, sociology. Okay, you, you had mentioned that, right? Mm -hmm. I, don't know, I don't know that I did. I, I started out initially as a political science major uh, and then shifted to sociology. Because I've, and part of that was, and I was really glad, I, I may have declared it that fall, fall of 69 actually. Um, the liberal arts school, you had, you had some time to make a decision. Uh, because I figure, well, I'm really concerned. I really want to change society, so maybe if I study sociology, I'll understand it better. Plus, the sociology department required less term papers than any other liberal arts degree. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> cheap way out. The um, so we we you know I started you know we just and the main thing we did there was we sold this newspaper, the Militant. Um, which was to me a kind of a dry version, uh, very, very uh, dialectical publication. 
I, I wanted to mention that, you know, probably in, uh, during 68 and 69, more and more um, underground newspapers were appearing on campus. There were papers from Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, uh, of course the Berkeley Barb, and, and there was papers from uh, the, the Midwest. And, uh, and then of course the Great Speckled Bird showed up. Do you recall any names of the others other than the... Berkeley Barb? Yeah. No. I could probably struggle and come up with a few, but not off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, um, but most importantly, the bird. <laughs> right, and, and this was great because here was one from Atlanta, you know, which was the capital of, of the South, of the New South, and also the center for you know the counterculture um, of of the South. You know, the the, the scene on the. Uh, on Peachtree Street, what they called the Strip. I mean, I didn't really, I really wasn't that much into uh, being a hippie, uh, but at the same time, I was very attracted to the culture. Uh, uh, I was more, you know, I, I was, I became more of a business person. I was, you know, definitely on the scale of the counterculture, I was definitely on the uh, political end of it rather than cultural. But not, but not as far as a lot of people did. But anyway, I got involved with this. I studied socialism, uh, and you know, sold this papers, and, and it was great because people got upset with us, and, uh, <clears throat> and it was. But it was also interesting that so many of my fellow uh, student uh, radicals, you know, were were kind of turned off. They didn't like the idea of being affiliated with any political party. And when you said you studied socialism, was that well, through that, like a reading group or were Yeah, well, no, no, they would send us books and they expected us to, you know, as, as, you know, I guess they were hoping that we would become members of the Socialist Workers Party. So we had to learn a lot. We had to study Marxism. We had to study, we had to study uh, Lenin uh, and of course Trotsky and learn, understand the differences between, between Trotsky and Stalin and how those, how, and how the, Socialist Workers Party differed from the uh, Communist Party of, of America, and so again we had to get into that, get into the weeds a little bit with that. It was really disciplined, and I'll never forget a couple years later meeting a a young uh, a young German student who was who was dating a friend of mine, uh, and uh, he, he telling me. That he and I asked him if he was part of the German socialist movement. And he said, "Oh no," he said, "I don't, uh, I don't have enough discipline uh, to be a socialist. You really have to study hard." <laughs> so that was uh, sort of the way that was. And in my, my personal, even though I enjoyed this up to a certain extent, and I'm really glad I did take a little bit of time uh, to study to study. Uh, Marx and Lenin and Trotsky a little more. Um, I really was st uh, also, I wasn't that hardcore. I, I really kind of wanted to have some freedom of expression and to go off of my own uh, adventuristic ways. So uh, I do remember we, we were frustrated, I guess, because we hadn't been a part of a group that had been arrested in January of that year. We presented the administration our own list of 10 non-negotiable demands. And uh, when the, uh, and the administration just laughed us off, and when our organizer came back into town, we showed him what we had been doing, he uh, disbanded our group, the, uh, the socialist work organizer, because he considered us too, I guess, off the wall, adventuristic, uh, uh, <laughs> unorthodox. We obviously weren't candidates to be disciplined party members. And how many, Folks, would you would you say were in your group? Oh, there was only about eight of us. Okay, mm -hmm. all all boys, all men, and uh, yeah, it, it, it was kind of funny. One one guy, I, yeah, Michael stayed with the group. He was the only one. Michael Lemons, uh, he was the only one that stayed in the group. But uh, and the rest of us, one of one of the guys in the group went off and joined the Vince Ramos Brigade went to Cuba, a couple of the other guys kind of got, got off into anarchistic little fringe groups. I just went back and hung out with the, uh, 
with the students and I, in that summer of course I was totally involved in my uh, in my project in, in the Vestal community the uh, war on poverty project that I had mentioned earlier mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know and I probably during that period got more and in, more into the uh, counterculture for a period there um, then we would come into the fall of 70 yeah, fall of 70, spring of 70, winter, spring of 71. Well, my friend that what that stayed in the Socialist Workers' Party said, look, you, you really want to do some anti-war work. We're having this great big mobilization. Uh, and we, we're trying to mobilize a lot of people for a march on, on Washington in the spring of 71. We want it. And we, then we also want to uh, have local demonstrations. And I said, that sounds pretty good, you know. Um, I'll be glad to work on that. So we, this was probably, like I said, late fall of 70, during the winter of 71, I just, with, he and I just sat down and organized how we're gonna organize a, a campus-wide uh, anti-war organization. And uh, I'd, I'd already set up a, a student, or you know, you had to go through a certain amount of paperwork to, to be able to hold, to have tables in the student center, and I had already set up an organization which uh, anyone could use. I think we called it Organization for Campus Action. And we just set it up, and, and I was the president, and a couple other people were the other two officers. And we just set it up so that, and we let, we just passed the word around. Even some of the um, uh, uh, right wing student groups were welcome to use this kind of front organization in order to set up a table. At the student center, I was, you know, pretty much into uh, democracy in the truest sense of the word. I didn't want anybody's uh, speech to be limited by uh, by paperwork. So we we initially used that, but we got our own group going. I forget what we called it. it might have been mobilization or something. But we we set it up, and uh, we we organized all these different committees: publicity, buses. Uh, March organized sign makers, uh, poster makers, and I called, you know, we passed signs out, put, got an advertisement in the student newspaper, passed flyers out, put signs up in the student center that we were planning to uh, hold, plan for a large demonstration in Knoxville in the spring, and we also were recruiting people for this massive march on Washington uh, to go. and. Um, I guess, you know, 150 people showed up. And it was just, the response was just overwhelming. Uh, we kept every, like I said, we, again, we just kept it very focused, stop the war, we didn't get off onto ending oppression or women's rights or even civil rights. You know, I mean, all that was kind of tacitly understood, but you know, the, the focus of this march was just opposing the war in Vietnam. We wanted as many people to participate that felt like, I remember a lot of the kids that showed up had brothers or fathers, cousins in the military. And, um, and they, were, they weren't interested in, in um, attacking participants in the war, mm -hmm. soldiers. It, I think it had a, it had a big appeal. Again, I think we got uh, three bus loads. It was a very I, and the thing that I, I was so proud of was I you know and I'm sorry I can't name but we had about six six committees and people just came together and I just said you know you figure out how you're going to do it let us know. I was sort of the unnamed uh, leader coordinator. I think I called me Mike who was the SWP guy. He sort of kept his profile real low because he didn't want to scare other people around. But he really was right there advising me, make, you know, and make, making, you know, giving me a second opinion. And it was just, it came together very nicely. Uh, people were, um, people worked, you know, in a, you know, cooperatively, uh, in a kind of. It was a beautiful and almost anarchistic organization. And you know we didn't we you know we had women uh, leading some of the committees. Um, my my uh, the woman I was going with at the time she had the speakers committee for the in town march. Um, 
And um, so anyway, it, it went very well. We came back, and then we started, you know, all these people came. It was one of the, it was I don't think it was quite as big as that November of 69 March, but it was a huge march. Um, and you also had the local action in Knoxville. Yeah, that we came, it was part of the two-step thing, but that was later, that was a month later. Okay. Um, it, you know, that it did get, there was, there, that was when the, I think the, I don't, I don't know, there, there was some, it was, there was some pretty bad violence, uh, that, in street violence there, uh, in, um, in that, in that spring demonstration, but, um, our group stayed pretty coherent, cohesive. When I think everybody came back, and nobody—I don't think anybody in our group contingent from Knoxville was arrested. A lot of the, a lot of the established University of Tennessee radicals pretty much disdained what we were doing, but they didn't interfere with us. And I, and I actually knew a few of them by, you know, was close to a few of them. A few of them had campaigned for Kennedy with me back when, uh, two years before, three years before. And uh, they were always, you know, accepting of me. You know, they said, "Well, you go ahead, Alvin. You do your little, do your little peace marks thing." But the rest of us really want a revolution. And uh, and they disdained you because they thought I would just I, wasn't disdain might be. They were just, you know, patronizing. Let's put it that way. Uh, but yeah, I guess because we were just so low key, so just one issue. Uh, anyway, but it, it was okay. Um, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I, 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 the, the, so um, we came back and we organized the march in Knoxville, and, it, and this was um, this went very well. Again, I went around. You know, of course, we got our permits with the police. We went and we, you know we took our little press releases to the TV stations. I went and spoke to a couple minister ministerial groups. Uh, I even went to the Veterans of Foreign War and the, uh, the AMVETS uh, and just spoke to them. Now, once again, you know, I just said, I know you guys aren't going to endorse us, but I just want you to know that we're not disrespecting any veterans or any soldiers in Vietnam. We just want, we, we're just exercising our political uh, rights to oppose this war. And it was real interesting. He said, yeah, and we're not going to support you, but the truth is, if truth be told, a lot of the young guys that are coming back from Vietnam that come here to our organizations, they say the war is full of shit. So he said, as long as you guys uh, are respectful of us, we're not going to interfere with you. Um, I, I met so many people during that. One of the first people I did go see to get some advice was um, the staff at the Highlander Center, which at that time was, was still located in in Knoxville, and there was a couple guys there that had been old uh, Norman. What was his name? Norman. Oh uh, well, the Wallace? Socialist Workers Party. Wallace. No, no, it was. No. Uh, anyway, that. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Like, forgive me, Bob Goodman. I don't remember everything, but anyway. Um, Foster. No. <laughs> but anyway, it was a guy who had run for. Uh, uh, president uh, as, a, as a socialist at one time. He had worked with that. Uh, uh, one of the guys in, in my group, actually, his parents had been socialists in the, in the late 30s uh, at, uh, at Berkeley. Evidently, there had been quite a group of, uh, of young socialists. I guess they were you know, around the labor movement and stuff like that uh, back, back then. And uh, so anyway, I, I did a re we did a real good job just laying the groundwork with, with the establishment, the government, the religious organizations. Uh, the, the Unitarian Church was very helpful. The Fellowship of Reconciliation uh, was very, American, American Friends Service Committee all showed up uh, and, and provided us with some, you know, with some financial support and adults that had some experience in, in doing demonstrations. Um, I don't remember any, particularly any of the civil rights groups getting involved, but there was black participation uh, in the march. And so we had, we held the march. They, I remember the headline uh, in the 
one of the local papers uh, the next day was, you know, uh, protest rally turns into prayer meeting. Kathy, who was uh, my girlfriend at the time uh, and head of the speakers committee, she got an Episcopal, a black Episcopal priest from uh, Philadelphia to come and be her keynote speaker. And of course, you know, he led prayers before and at the end of his of his speech, and it just, it really went over well uh, with the local media. Now, I remember some of my, uh, it was kind of funny, some of my radical friends uh, were just outraged that we were holding this uh, totally compromised uh, milk sop demonstration and weren't calling for the, the burning of the city. So, uh, I mean, and I let two or three of them out at the, at the point, I said, well, after the, uh, what? Well, I forget, it was probably before the keynote speaker. I said, you can go ahead and have your have your five minutes. And because I guess because they knew me, they were respectful. You know, they just got up and gave their rabble rousing speech. Uh, and they kept it five minutes or whatever I had told them to please do. And it were it were everybody, everybody it worked out. They weren't mad at me. Uh, and yet they, they, you know, they got their, their moment uh, to speak. But then the final speaker was, was this established minister from Philadelphia. And it just all went over well. So I felt very, very uh, gratified for that because I, I was just, uh, you know, obsessed. You know, I was, uh, it had become an obsession for me, the war in Vietnam by that point, with so many people. I had four Four of my uh, classmates in high school had died in Vietnam, and uh, it just was um, something I, I wanted to do, and I felt like we, I, with the help of a lot of friends, had pulled off a very successful action. And it, you know, and I, and it, by that point, you know, I, a lot of people, I had gained some notoriety. You know, they one of the one of the candidate, the liberal candidate for student government, asked me to run as a senator on his ticket. I, holier than thou, I declined and said, "No, I can't get involved in partisan politics." <laughs> so anyway, that's what that's how that went. I guess you know the only thing I, you know, I, I the only thing that I remember, I guess back it was in that summer, that spring of '70, when I was. Um, had my little uh, uh, venture into socialism. That was when Kent State happened. That's right. And uh, it was pretty amazing. Our campus went on strike. We, we, we were amazing in that it, this largely 95% white campus had elected a, a black student government president that year. He, his, his name was Jimmy Baxter. He's now a uh, I hear he's a successful lawyer, probably retired by now in, uh, in Tennessee. He, uh, he had been a veteran, so he was an older undergraduate. Uh, and I guess he had a certain maturity and gravitas. But, you know, but, he, but he looked like, you know, he had, a, he had an afro and he just looked, you know, and all the signs he ran were, were his black face on a red background. But, it, but he actually was, you know, pretty pretty level-headed, and I'll never forget him come, you know, when, the, when we went on strike after Kent State, and he came to, you know, people were talking about burning the ROTC building and blockading the, uh, some of the classroom buildings, and he just came and said, I got a call from the governor a little while ago, and he said, if we start, if we totally disrupt, he said, if we want to stay out of classes, those of us that want to do it, that's fine, you know, they're not going to try and stop us, but if we start trying to blockade buildings or burning buildings, uh, they're going to send in the National Guard and their guns will be loaded. <laughs> and, uh, and he made some comment about, well, uh, you know, when I was in the Army, I've seen what, the, what an M16 uh, bullet shell can do to a human body, and you really don't want to be on the end of that. I don't forget what he said exactly, but it, it was pretty convincing, and he, he, he kept things pretty calm. We did, we did have a spontaneous march on Washington, and I remember riding up in a carload of, a couple carloads of friends went up together. 
and that that was an ugly that was an ugly scene. There was a lot of uh, street violence, a lot of tear gas and pepper gas. I'll I'll never forget getting up getting behind a group of kids that was going down the street. They seemed to be well organized. They all were wearing the same type of uh, overcoats, and they had bags slushed over by their side. They had a bag on their side. It turned out later that was that was for tear gas masks. And uh, I remember following them, and they started breaking windows or, or smashing uh, stores and cars and stuff. And I'll never forget, I picked up something that was about the size of a half brick. It was a stone or a, an old brick, and I was looking for the right target. I was so mad, and I saw Bank of America. And I took my stone and threw it right, right at the sign, and the stone hit the window and bounced on the ground. And I, and I just said, you know what, you know, it, it, it suddenly clicked on me that, you know, you're not going to overthrow the government or break the establishment uh, by this sort of somewhat of ad hoc means, you know, you really got, you really got to know what you're doing. And I, I think that was kind of a, of a precursor to what, uh, what I did the following year when I organized the mobilization. I apologize for mm -hmm. getting that out of sync, but I think that's so, in my head it sort of clicked that, you know, that the uh, government, the establishment is a very strong thing and you're not just going to knock it over because you're mad at it. You've got to work, you've got to work against it constructively. Going back to say, anyway, after 71, things started quiet, quieting down. I did get, I did get involved uh, a little bit with some of the uh, anti-nuclear war groups. I remember going over to Oak Ridge a couple times for uh, little sit-ins outside there. Um, that was always ironic for me, for me, because my father, you know, he part of his, a lot of his work centered on, on nuclear science, uh, and he. He actually consulted um, with some of the scientists at Oak Ridge, uh, and, and actually, it, you know, when he was at Lockheed, he worked on the uh, on the nuclear airplane. If you know about that, uh, so that was part of his training. So I guess that kind of gets me. You know, after you know, I hung around for a while. It took me an extra year to graduate. I, I, you know, we, we still had an anti-war movement, but it was mainly just, to, just consisted of going to increasingly smaller demonstrations in Washington. There was a march in Atlanta one, one cold fall day uh, that we took a couple busloads here for. Um, but it was, it was mainly a, a little more low-key, and I, I, I still was, uh, uh, you know, nominal head of this uh, any more mobilization, but there really wasn't much done other than maybe uh, some sort of educational program every every fall. Mm -hmm. um, I graduated uh, by this time. I had subscribed to the bird and was you know really wanting to do something, but I really was dealing with just the reality of trying to um, of, of uh, you know make a living, feed myself after graduating from. From college, because what what quarter do you graduate? I graduated. I should you know if, if I followed the four year course, I would have graduated in in May of 1971. I graduated in December of 72. Okay. Uh, the only thing I, uh, there was there was some sort of of um, F, F worth. There was an F worth center. Uh, in the Fort Sanders community, just a few blocks from the Tennessee campus. Uh, they offered me a very low subsidized apartment for about 40 or $50 a month because I was a so-called student activist. But uh, after a while, I kind of had to let that, let that go um, because I really wasn't that active, especially after I graduated. So I had about a three year, you know, except for maybe reading the bird and, and talking and drinking and talking with my friends of, of not being terribly involved 
um, in the political situation. But I really wanted to be more engaged, and uh, it came up with me that, uh, that I really would like to go to Atlanta or some other city and work for an underground newspaper. I'd always been, I'd always had that uh, journalistic bent since I'd been uh, in high school. I was disappointed that I never worked for the campus, college campus paper. And uh, so, well, what we'd, we'd actually went to the, um, what was it called? The Boston Phoenix. But that was a really big operation and they really weren't interested in a couple southern kids. I, I had decided to go on this venture with, with Kathy, my girlfriend at the time. But we also came to uh, came to Atlanta and interviewed with the Bird Collective had had uh, had an opening that they'd advertised. And we came here and interviewed at the time. And we were, you know, we really hit it off with the people. It was when the office was on Juniper Street. But they didn't hire either one of us. I forget who they came up with. And at that time, I think uh, it was back when Rick and Liza were on the paper. I think maybe Krista had just started because I think she remembered us. So was that maybe like 73? Uh, 74. 74, yeah. January, late fall of 73, uh, January, February of 74. And you were still living in Knoxville. Right. And how were you supporting yourself? Well, I did a number of things. I worked, uh, I worked as a land, a groundskeeper at an apartment complex. I did construction work where I got myself fired for refusing to work on, on a holiday. And, uh, and then I worked as a hospital orderly. That was the other mm -hmm. major job period. So um, I forget we there after after the you know after the disruption at the bird uh, when when Rick and Liza left and started the Gazette I guess they had some more openings and they hired both Kathy and me. She was ready to go and she came right away. And what is Kathy's last name? Ellison. She's in the box the same mm -hmm. time I show up. Uh, I, I haven't spoken with her in, in years and years, but. Uh, I, I know she's still alive and still very much, very much involved. Um, um, she, she's a, a lesbian activist now, uh, lives in Florida. She was very much into uh, natural healing and health food and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, but I noticed she publishes uh, in her Facebook page, she'll friend, you know, uh, move on and this kind of stuff. And she came on and she took the job of advertising manager. I came on a little bit later and came on, uh, took the position of uh, circulation manager, I guess is what they called it. Now, at that, you know, we, neither one of us was prolific, prolific writers. She, you know, she had been, uh, she could write on, she could write on, on women's issues. Um, but uh, I pretty much had writer's block from my freshman year in college when freshman composition pitch, uh, instructor had tried to, uh, to curb my uh, enthusiasm for writing and did too good a job, I guess. But I, I, I did, in the, my, the course of my time at the Bird, I did write a few short articles when something was needed, something needed to be covered, do this, I could do that. But I mainly just did my circulation work and, and go for work. I considered it, you know, I considered it my mission, my goal to make things go as smoothly and as efficiently as possible so the people that did the, the serious writing like Cliff or Bob or the people that did political stuff had space to do that and I m made sure the office was running. Mm -hmm. You know, John and Krista were doing local news and uh, so that, that was the way I plugged in. Like I, I, I mean I had followed the paper for years, you know, a lot of the people there were, the start of the paper are five or six years older than me. That's old enough that you really treat them with, with some respect. Um, so I was just, just in awe, you know, like the first time I saw Tom Coffin, or Bob Goodman, or Steve Weiss, Roger Friedman. When do you think that you, you first encountered the bird? Sue Thrasher. Well, I, I'm pretty sure I saw them 
in 68. I'm pretty sure I saw it. You mean as a, just the yeah, publication? Just the publication. I'm, sure, I'm sure I saw it that fall. That, or uh, maybe not that, that first spring when they came out, but by fall. Just because the Allman Brothers were such uh, a sensation in the South. That uh, and the and the bird had such good coverage of them. So I'm, I'm uh, and you know there were people going. A lot of people were just going to Atlanta to be at the strip. And of course that's one of the big things at the strip when you would go down there to Peachtree Street would be to buy a bird, to buy a bird. You know get your get your nickel bag of marijuana, get yourself some beads, and uh, uh, you know get take a take a try at panhandling, buy a great speckled bird. From a street vendor. <laughs> so, so is that where you? So a lot of people, a lot of people I knew in you know in the left culture uh, uh, were bringing papers back, and it, it didn't take me long. I'm pretty sure as soon as I got a job and had a little bit of money of my own, I'm pretty sure I got a subscription right away because I, I was you know I was I took politics seriously. I wasn't quite ready to be a, a member of. of a socialist or a communist party, but I, I was very dedicated to wanting to change society. So as you recall it, it wasn't that there was necessarily a newsstand or were no uh, somewhere yeah, at no in Knoxville that was I, I believe the I believe England's music would have a few papers there. But uh, I you know but kids would just come there were kids that would probably get them sent to them and they would take take a shot at trying just to sell them, and I would I preferred to buy from a street mm -hmm. vendor, even in Knoxville. There was always a couple guys there that um, made a little. You know, they would sell the bird in several other papers. Yeah, and it, you know, it was just a it was just a beacon of truth and hope for uh, for kids out in the southern hinterlands. <laughs> uh, that's truly the way we saw it. We were, and you know, we we were all. I mean, everybody was proud of the bird. That it was our southern paper, our standard bearer for the counterculture and the new left. Uh, and like I said, I read it regularly, so I was familiar with many of the of the bylines and names in the staff box. Mm -hmm. And then you'd make pilgrimages to right. Atlanta. A, a couple of my friends came, actually came to and the, the two or three years before I did. One, one of the women, Barbara, went on to be a, uh, a TV uh, camera person for one of the local t, uh, TV stations in Knoxville. But I think about three of them, her and Mark, who was, uh, who was kind of one of the uh, uh, yippies, anarchists, and, and Eddie Taub, uh, they came here and uh, I spent, they spent a week. And the bird would let people come in work with, you know, just do stuff in the uh, office, you know, and help on production night, uh, and maybe maybe go on a circulation route. Uh, anyway, they spent a week, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like an internship visitation to the bird, and they came back just full of how great everybody was and how, how much fun it was. I never did that, but uh, I know they did it. They were my closest friends. They did it, and a few other people did it as well. And that probably would have been around 1970 or 71. But you would come into the city. I came into for the, demonstrations uh, or yeah, two or three just times to for visit demonstrations. Or, I remember coming here with my friend who went on the Vince Ramos brigade, uh, and that was a very different situation because that was kind of a quasi illegal activity, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, just drop. You know, I drove him here and dropped him off and drove his car back to Knoxville. Can you talk a bit about, a little more about what you, your impression of Atlanta, sort of the mood of Atlanta at this time, and if you can uh, well, relate that or compare that to how you remembered Atlanta from your childhood and when your grandparents were here and... Oh goodness, I mean Atlanta when I would... I remember driving up from Macon, you know, there was no interstates back in those days, and just driving up, I guess, what was Moreland Avenue, um, through, uh, and then come up, cut over, I guess, over Confederate Avenue or something to get over to uh, my, my 
grandparents on the west end. I remember living in Sandy Springs, which was all, Atlanta was a long way, but you could take a bus. Um, my parents would sometimes just go sight, sightseeing on Sunday. We would drive downtown, and there was, it was nothing like today. I mean, I guess the, the come in to go to Riches. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and the Sears, the Sears there uh, were the, uh, what the Midtown. What's it called now? The uh, Ponce Market is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I'm Lin I remember when Linux Square was built. I understand Gene Guerrero's father was a, a major contractor on building and building that complex. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was just a it was a real big town. But I mean, it, it was nothing compared to today. And even even by the time I came back in '74, well, when I started coming back as a as a young adult, '68, '69, '70, it still was starting to grow pretty quickly. You know, the the Re Hyatt, Hyatt Regency was there. The, you could actually see the uh, the blue dome back in those days. So, but but uh, as I told you in the early part, I mean the South was really divided. I mean, uh, you, know, you know, it was conservative versus liberal, black versus white, um, and, and and in in the political movement, I mean, there was men versus women. I mean, there was there was a lot a lot of men were not ready to accept feminism, even amongst the leftist community right away. And then there was, all, there was even conflict amongst ourselves, the people that were more hardcore, uh, party-line leftists, uh, and those of us that were a little more loosey-goosey. And then, of course, there was always, you know, then there was the total culture freaks. A lot of those kids probably wound up voting for Reagan a few years later. So. Uh, it, it was a it was a tough area. It was a tough time politically, but I mean, is it any different today? Uh, I think the war was a uh, th th that was really raw. I don't think since since the Civil War the country had been divided of, of, about a foreign issue or a war issue, and that because people were having their lives ruined by the war, whether, whether they went to the war and came back injured, dead, or, you know, or, or, or psychologically traumatized. People feeling that those of us that opposed the war uh, were anti-patriotic or, you know, uh, against them in some way. Uh, that was very, very disturbing. There was a lot of anger and resentment around that. Atlanta was a very exciting place because we were electing a black mayor, and I had followed that story the, of, of the rise of Maynard Jackson and was just very enthusiastic about that. You know, and of course, it was so funny to have my uh, grandfather mention that he remembered Maynard Jackson as a young man coming to the post office uh, and how what a fine young uh, inward he was. And, uh, you know, because that's the only way he could talk about white people. And so, um, but, but I also want to say, you know, I mean, it, it, and I said, it's, it was a really exciting period to be a young 20 year old or 25 year old. I mean, the whole world was opening up culturally, artistically. There were, we, had, we had wonderful music, you know. We had, you know, freedom as individuals. I mean, I could, you know, I didn't feel like I had to, you know, get a get a white collar job and, uh, you know, get married and and um, raise a family in the suburbs. I felt like I could do what I wanted, and there was a lot of other people that were not do what I wanted, but I had a lot of freedom to not uh, plug in and join the establishment right away. I felt that there was there was terrible things wrong with our society, and I wanted to focus on that. And I, I found a way to do that, especially you know working with the bird initially, and then some of the things I did over the next eleven years um, were also uh, very uh, alternative, counterculture oriented, politically uh, uh, motivated toward political social change. So. It was a very troubling period. It was a very divisive period. Yet at the same time, it was a very exciting, stimulating period. And I was aware that I had freedoms and opportunities that 
my parents who had grown up in the Depression did not have. Um, I was grateful um, for my forebears. I was grateful for FDR <laughs> and the New Deal. I had enough sense to uh, appreciate that. And uh, I wanted to plug in and uh, be a part of making making another step in the evolution of society. I guess uh, I didn't really know what I was bumping up against at that age. So that's why I... And so when you come, come get to Atlanta in 74, where do, you, where do you settle? Where's your first place that you take up residence? Well, we came there with, with, with jobs such as they were at the Great Speckled Bird. I, I think that Kathy and I were the last two people to draw salaries from the Great Speckled Bird. I remember Doyle counting out bird money, bird box money, in little piles of quarters, in uh, big piles of quarters, and, and uh, rolling them up and giving them to uh, in the first month or two, several people drew it, but the last, I think in December or January was the last time they distributed money. We got $60 each for a month of work. Okay. I, 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 and even I, paid I, in quarters? Like in I think so, yeah. yeah. Out, of, out of the vending there probably boxes. Were a few dollars, there probably were a few dollars from other miscellaneous stuff, but yeah, pretty mm -hmm. a lot of it was in quarter rolls. <laughs> and... Uh, it was, it, you know, I really, I hadn't planned on that. I thought, because they, they had told us initially that people were getting paid $60 a week, and that was, that was tight, but you could do it. We wound up, for a while, I, I, I had, I got food stamps. I really wasn't real happy about that, but I wanted to work for the bird and full time, and they needed people there pretty much full time. I'm sure I worked 50 or 60 hours a week, but they really needed people. They needed, we needed to man an office. Anyway, that's the part of how I did it. I remember working. I got I got a little my first taste of accounting because I worked uh, that winter of '75 doing taxes for a, a little black CPA in Decatur. Uh, you know, we set up a table in you know these various little department stores along Memorial Drive and in Candler Road uh, in the black in the early uh, East Atlanta black communities and and, and did people's uh, taxes for them <laughs> that was one of the ways I supported myself I did little things like worked put up these little uh, advertisements in grocery stores but for the most part I, I was there at the bird for the first year and a half um, or and, that, and where were you living? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no. So Krista, I mean, as soon as, I mean, uh, I think K Kathy stayed, Krista found um, a place for Kathy and me in the basement of a house across the street from her own, I think it was Colquitt Avenue, Little Five Points, Inman Park, $40 a month. This little basement apartment. It was kind of like a. It was like a dollhouse in the basement. I mean, I think the ceilings were six, six and a half feet high. If I'd been tall, I, it never would have been. It was a tiny little place. Um, you know, we had a tiny little living room and a, just a little, only like an efficiency kitchen. But that's where we stayed, and it was great. It was forty dollars a month. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we we could take. We both had a both had running Volkswagens at that time, and. Um, we were, we were set it up. Krista was so great. I mean, she was just like, you know, hostess with the most. She, she took me around and, you know, took me to the Coffin's house, took me to several, took me to the uh, Brodak Monty's house and uh, I think the Britting's house. Uh, several people to Charlie Cushing and people that weren't necessarily members of the bird but were part of that over, uh, that supporting community around it. So, and, you know, she showed us places. She took, probably took us to the manuals for the first time. The guy who, uh, re, who I replaced as circulation manager, uh, Michael Cooper, he worked at Jaggers, uh, and he took me, over, took me over to Emory Village, and there was a vegetarian restaurant over there. And so I went to Jaggers and uh, everybody's in that vegetarian restaurant, whatever it was called. 
we, you know, as members of the birds, we got, we got complimentary meals to rest several restaurants around town. We can get complimentary tickets to the Great Southeast Music Hall and Richards and the Electric Ballroom. So things are, I mean, like the first concert, I remember I got, we got free tickets to see uh, uh, Jimmy Buffett and Joan Baez uh, at Georgia Tech. That was one of the first things I got to do. And of course I got a couple free, like I said, a couple free meals um, uh, every week at various restaurants. I think we gave them free advertising and they would give us like 10 free meals a week that could be distributed amongst the staff. When my truck broke down, uh, Charlie Cushing, who was a Jaguar BMW mechanic, you know, fixed my Volkswagen for me. <laughs> so that was that. And when, when we first moved there, the, the, the office was still at uh, on the Juniper Street location. Mm -hmm. And they were just, they had just, you know, they, yeah, they were, I guess they were getting evicted. <laughs> Probably somebody wanted to fix it up or maybe just tear it down. I, for, I'm not sure. But we bought a, we, we, we got, we rented a new place on what's now Ralph McGill, then it was called Forest Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jim McMeans, who was a, a carpenter of some skill, uh, recruited me to help him fit out the new, the new building. So I spent about two weeks, you know, putting up, putting up uh, uh, sheetrock walls and well, I'm doing some simple electric work with him. We used my little VW truck uh, haul a lot of the materials around. I think that might have been that and along with the fact that it was kind of good to throw papers in when it wasn't uh, raining. That's why I got the job of circulation manager. Uh, I don't think, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, and I, I'm sorry I don't remember. You probably, other people you've interviewed, I don't know exactly how it worked whether uh, we were immediately members of the collective or whether we had to, I think we, it took a month or two before they had, the, the actual collective members felt comfortable with us enough to accept us into the collective. There was a huge group of volunteers and people that were always there, a lot of old staff members. And I think a lot of them maybe had, some of them had permanent status as collective members, but it wasn't just anybody that showed out, showed up to help with layout or sell a paper could could come and be a voting member of the collective. Mm -hmm. It was a very it was a very difficult process because we we, we basically used consensus decision making I think for almost all decisions. So that meant you had to agree, you had, or come to a compromise, and you and to do that you had to trust people. So that was always a, a, a pretty, uh, getting accepted to the collective was a big deal. And, and even though I, I, I had incredible respect and deference to people on the, the older members of the collective, um, I took that part of my job very seriously. In other words, I always felt uh, if I had a difference or a concern, I, it was my duty to express it. Uh, if I needed, if I, before I could go along with the decision, you know, I had to be full, completely, I, didn't, I had to be comfortable with enough uh, of, of what was going on. I had to understand what was going on. And, if, uh, you know, you would work out compromises for the, for, uh, for the, for the decisions that needed to be made. Um, the people that work there, I mean, I, I, at the time that I was there, I mean, I really think I respected John Jacobs the most. The kind of uh, reporting he did uh, on local news was just phenomenal. And you know, Krista was working with him. She was he was she, he was sort of training her. She she readily acknowledged that. Uh, but also, you know, Teresa Secules was I think she was the international editor. Doyle Neiman was our business manager. Um, who else? Uh, Mickey Mickey Gilmore. Uh, she was our she was our editor. She she was she was just 
she wielded that uh, red pencil like a Excalibur. <laughs> but uh, but we all pitched in on that. I mean, I we all pitched in on typing the paper. We did bring in a woman who we actually paid, uh, I think, a, sm a small salary to, who was a good typist. But everybody had to take a turn mm -hmm. at the word. I guess we called it a word processor or whatever they called it. Was it was it still the the IBM composer? Yeah, composer. Or? IBM, yeah. yeah, and it had fonts and you know, these mm -hmm. little balls that you would put. And, you know, they were, you know, they were breaking. I mean, it would have to cost a fortune to replace it. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, so everybody did a stint of that. And, and most people helped with layout. I believe we did layout on Wednesday night. Because uh, I think we paper would come back Thursday afternoon we would put them and we would do the circulation rounds but and anyway, where was it being printed at this time uh, the Walton Ter Tribune in Monroe Georgia okay and if, if we if we didn't make our deadline there was a, a trailways or a Greyhound bus that left like 3 in the morning for uh, from Monroe Georgia sometime in the uh, mid early morning if we didn't make that, then somebody had to drive it to Monroe in the middle of the night because it had to be there by 6 a.m. for them to print it and have it back to us that night. So I, 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 I got pulled that duty a couple times. But you know, it was just, it was part of the thing. I, like I said, it, it was, it was, that part of it was real, it was real stressful. I mean, we, we would have, uh, you know, strong political discussions. In my memory, I mean, I heard periods of terrible things, that, of terrible fights they would have in the years before, especially when the, when the different leftist political factions were fighting for dominance and they have their, their will. I mean, uh, a lot of those people had, had left. A lot of them, you know, had maybe just calmed down. Uh, and then, I mean, John used to talk about what he called them the, the gay Maoist crazies. <laughs> and that was his way of describing a part of what went on. And then, of course, there was a, there was a, the paper was deeply wounded by the divisions that came when the Gazette was founded. Rick and Liza, I think, had come in. They evidently were very charismatic, very energetic, very bright. Had really picked up the paper for a while. They were sort of co-man, a couple that was kind of a pow, almost a, another Tom and Stephanie. And... Um, but then I think they wanted to, as everybody said, they, I mean, I, this is all secondhand, uh, that they had kind of wanted to water down the political impact and content of the paper and make it more cultural. Uh, and a lot of the people just, just didn't want to go, didn't want to go there. So they left and took some talented writers, Neil Herring, with them. And of course they took, and then, yeah, I mean, Neil was a very close friend of Rick's. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know where the, I don't know if Pearl Clegg was ever a part of the bird or not, but I know she she was she would have been a, a good fit for the bird, but she wrote for the Gazette uh, when it was when it was publishing. Her name was Pearl Lomax at that time. Uh, but um, it was it was kind of a down period, you know, and so we had kind of just got, you know, we had because how long before you got there? I I'm had, not sure. Had I think it happened in the spring or summer that they left, because I the the Gazette had just started around the time we we landed. Uh, so, but and I'm sure it took them several months. Uh, I, I I just don't remember the exact timeline. I wasn't here for that, and I didn't. I wasn't aware of the Gazette until I came to Atlanta, and I wasn't really there. I don't think there was any discussion in the paper about what, what it was going through. But I could see there was a lot of traumatized people around. Uh, the, the there were two people who were just really great. You know, just were always upbeat, always encouraging. Uh, always supportive, you know, and that was always really important to me, Kathy and myself, and that was Stephanie and Bob, uh, Bob Goodman. You know, they were just always there, always just encouraging people, always had something good to say, you know. Uh, Bob wasn't a, you know, he mainly would just come in with articles, but he would show up sometimes, I think, for collective meetings. Stephanie, 
I didn't see, I don't know what, she might have been dealing with her two little boys the first month, but after the first month she was there almost every day. Uh, and and, and, uh, and, in, and in my opinion, uh, there was kind of the, the group of women, Stephanie, Teresa, uh, and Mickey, during that period I was there, 74 and 75, they really were a real foundation of, I guess, just strength and support, you know, of, um, but, you know, they were all, they were kind of like, you know, all business, but let's get the work, you know, let's get the work done, let's stay together, let's don't get off on any more political tangents that could, you know, divide us. Uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't think we would have lasted as long as we did without that kind of stability they created. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, I mean, like I said, John was a real creative force. He was really, you know, the, there were people calling him up all the time, giving him tips about what was going on at City Hall and county government. Uh, and, uh, and Doyle Neiman, you know, I mean, he was just he was just a real smart, savvy business guy. Kept a positive attitude in spite of all the financial difficulties. Always trying to figure out a way to keep the creditors at bay and keep us. You know, it was all just let's just keep you know, during that period. It was just let's just keep this thing going. So whatever you know, whatever differences we had, uh, they were buried just to get the paper out. And there was also. This thing has got to be as good as we possibly can. I mean, if we made if we made a factual error, we admitted it and corrected it. Um, and it was just you know, and I just remember everybody, all the editors, uh, Teresa, Stephanie, uh, and uh, Mickey. It was just we're going to make this as good as we possibly can, you know. And then of course we would go in at night. And and lay it out, work long. I mean, we were already exhausted, but to get that paper out, uh, different people, David Jenkins, who was a graphic artist, who eventually went on to work for the, what is it, the uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority of New York, Bob, um, Bob Dorland, Bill Fibben, uh, a noted photographer. The, all these people came in and helped us lay out and make it look as good as we could. Dinah Kohler, Came in around the time I did. Uh, she was a, she did some beautiful graphic uh, work for us. Um, so it was just you know people really loved the bird and we kind of put aside our differences to make this thing as good as we could and to keep it going as long as we could. You know for you know for me you know the bird was just an icon something that I had respected for years and I was just so glad to be a part of it and other people that were coming in Cliff understood how important the bird was how significant it was so I'm glad he I know he was glad to participate uh, in, in, in putting his historical series in the paper so mm -hmm. That was the way it was. And there were, there were all these people that just would come around. One of the other people, I don't know if anybody else has mentioned this, and I, I wish I could remember her last name. It was a woman called Dell, Dell Gyp, Del the Gypsy or Gypsy Dell, older woman in her 70s at the time. Uh, claimed she had been a, a, a beatnik in Midtown in the, in the 30s and 40s, and she was on a first name uh, uh, basis with uh, Margaret Mitchell. She would just come in and do, you know, stamp letters, help everybody, you know. Mickey was the primary co copy editor, but every, but every article had to be read three or four times. So, you know, everybody looked at it and everybody took a turn in typing, so. That was, there was just people like that. And then there were some, every once in a while a high school kid would come in and we had a, I don't know if other people talked about it, but we had interns from Antioch and, Oberlin and other, other uh, very liberal universities. They would come and work with us three or six months, and these kids were always great, uh, full of energy and crazy ideas, and they would they usually fit in right away with the people at the Bird. I, I always I, I I don't remember too many of them by uh, their names, but I, I remember I liked them all. Do you remember whether you? 
who supervised or coordinated the, those internships? Or? My guess is Teresa. Okay. And because she was an Antioch a graduate, she graduated mm -hmm. from Antioch, mm -hmm. and she had done internships. Yeah. But I'm. But I know Tom and <coughs> Stephanie would always find people a place to stay. I would. I, I can't imagine Krista wouldn't have, wouldn't have done for them like she did for Kathy and myself. Mm -hmm. You know, help get people oriented to Atlanta. Make sure got got people a few dinners at people's houses. Uh, mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff when you first get in. Yeah, because I know that the the Atlanta Lesbian Feminist Alliance Alpha at some point in the seventies was also having Antioch. Really? Interns. Okay. I'm I'm pretty sure they were from Antioch, but in interns from colleges mm -hmm. <laughs> up north, and it's in their newsletters and you know the so of working out the logistics of where are they going to stay and making sure that you know. They're paid and fed and. Um. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm sure WRFG, uh, where I also worked for a year as a bookkeeper, a few years later, they had uh, Antioch interns. Mm -hmm. But I think there were interns from other schools as well. But yeah. Antioch was regular. So. Can we have a break? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're coming back from, from another little break. Um, and you, you had just been describing um, a lot of the people involved in the bird tangentially, the interns from Antioch. Um, I thought I would go on a little bit just about the, uh, the weekly, the day-to-day -day operations. I don't remember exactly uh, how every day went, but those of us that were staff would come in uh, and just you know just get things going, answering the phones, uh, re you know going through the mail, changing the subscription uh, addresses, or adding and uh, subtracting people. I usually had to uh, go out and fix a bird box somewhere. They would they would be vandalized or just get worn out. Um, just that sort of wouldn't yeah, open, and then, or and then of course, usually after, right after the weekend, we would go out and uh, uh, you know check on things. I guess actually we, we picked up the money when we put out the papers on <coughs> Thursday night, if that if I remember correctly, that was the night we did distribution. But we would have we would it, I think usually on Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, we would have the staff meeting where the uh, various content editors would present their, their main storylines uh, for the week. Some weeks we would have local news as a headline. Sometimes there would be a cultural event, a cultural story. Uh, or sometimes there we might go with an international story. Uh, generally it was local. Uh, from time to time there would be a, a, a cultural issue that would, you know, some headliner. I don't, you know, I know in the early days like uh, the Dahlman Brothers Band would be featured. So, um, and how many staff, paid the staff? Time, or? Well, I, I, well, what we, I guess you'd call regular staff. There was hardly any paid staff. Uh, but there was, I guess there would usually be about uh, eight people in the office on a regular day. And for the staff meeting, 12 or 14 people would show up. Like I said, a lot. It seems like, like uh, uh, Bob Goodman would show up for the staff meetings if he could. Uh, I know Stephanie was, was always coming uh, to the staff meetings, uh, though she was, didn't really have a, a real position. But uh, all the editors, Doyle, uh, Doyle was always there. Uh, John, and, John and Krista were always there, uh, you know, telling us about, and it was, it was always a lot of fun, especially because uh, we would get updated, especially on the local news. Steve Seberg, who was the cultural editor, on and off, he was a, a, a local artist who had been, who had really traveled all around the world. Uh, he was there. Uh, so and we would what, have. What were the editorial positions? The main editors I remember are, are are cultural, international news, and local news. Um, and then there's the circulation manager and the, the advertising, advertising manager, which was uh, very discouraging. 
my friend <laughs> had that position, which was one of the toughest. Mine wasn't good either because the so subscriptions were declining the whole period I was there. And then, of course, uh, the Doyle, the uh, business manager, was tracking the money and dealing with the, with the leases and permits, whatever we had to have uh, to stay, uh, stay legal in the, in the city. Some of the some of the meetings would be very uh, fraught with uh, with stress because there might be some political differences or just timing whether whether this story some local news story should be run now or going to, something that John found or Krista found is going to offend somebody and what are the consequences of this going to be you know that that kind of stuff uh, we generally we were the bird you know we usually went. We took the. We would usually make the hard decision if we had to, even if we knew that we were going to get a call from the from the mayor's aides or the you know or, or Reggie Eves's office or or James Bond at the city hall. We we usually would take the hit if we felt the story was important and we could verify it. It was real. I mean, people might be surprised to hear this. People that were not sympathetic to the left, but we were very concerned about being factual and truthful and I know that Krista and John especially worked very hard on that and the rest of them supported them in that you know we might have a, a political line that we might want to want to be true but if there were if there were flaws in our in our uh, heroines or uh, that would that would that would have to be uh, shown as well And that was usually the toughest part, working through those editorial decisions. Um, and then, you know, there was always some discussion about, during those periods, about what had to be cut next because uh, funds were continuing to diminish. I was, uh, as, I, as I think I've made clear, I, I was not the most uh, uh, disciplined uh, leftist, Marxist in the group. I, I, referred to, I've always called myself a socialist uh, and, and, and uh, tried to uh, act like one, but I also had a lot of uh, interest in the, in the countercultural movement, especially with regards to uh, healthy living, natural foods, and I had a, and I had a lot of sympathy to the, uh, to the arts community and the, uh, and the music. I was good friends with uh, some of my closest friends, just on a personal basis, were Julia Cade and Ward Silver, who did the music articles. Uh, I was real close. Seberg um, was an old, he was probably the oldest member of the collective. I think he was a whopping 43 when I came there. And uh, he, he, he was a, a little bit of a, of a free spirit, of an old beatnik. He had, a lot of the women felt he had some sec uh, some bad sexist tendencies. Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not sure his uh, Swedish wife would would have agreed with that, but he, he was a little he was definitely a little more into X-rated material than the, than the rest of us. And <coughs> uh, he made that known. He liked I think I think but yeah he did and and uh, was there that type of. Well, at that time, sharing I, and, and humor. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and I mean, I mean, well, some. I mean, you we we, we you know, well, you know how difficult sexual politics are now, and, and and gay and gay rights was and lesbian rights were very much present too, which had not near evolved nearly to the point that it had now. I mean. Uh, it, it, you know, and they were fairly underrepresented during that period. Like I think there might have been some that might have been some of the stuff that that John was referring to. It happened maybe a year or two before, where there had just got it just gotten uh, too much. And uh, I, I guess you know I, I knew uh, a lot about Alpha, say, but I very rarely would, would an Alpha woman come by and bring anything. Mm -hmm. We I think we. We carried their advertisements, and we and we covered a lay and a gay and lesbian events. Uh, but um, was Burl Bo Boykin still involved? Yes, mm -hmm. and he was a theater reviewer. Yeah, and he he was openly gay, and wrote wrote some on 
Yeah, he, game I, I, he probably politics. was the one that covered covered that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Burl was a good friend of mine. I remember, uh, uh, and, 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 and the woman I was I was living with, my girlfriend, she was uh, becoming lesbian while I was with her, uh, and we actually we actually broke up uh, over her sexual decision uh, while 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 we were there. Uh, but um, yeah, that, that that was there. I mean. Bill Cutler, who wrote a lot of articles on bicycles and transportation, he was openly gay, and I think also George Mitchell. I don't know if, if those names uh, mean anything to you or not. Um, so, but also, but what I was getting about with Steve was anyway, it just, you know, just it, it was very, it was always difficult, you know. I mean, I I pretty much had committed to uh, being a feminist back in 1965 or 66. I heard. Betty Friedan on the radio, WCKY out of Cincinnati or someplace, talking about the feminine mystique, and I said, "Oh yeah, I buy that." <laughs> so that was, that was just so I had always I had felt pretty comfortable, but of course, you never know. You know, even today, you just never know when you might subconsciously say or do something that someone would take offense at. So it was a dicey, it was a dicey area. But a lot of the, well, but what I was getting at was a lot of the artistic people, uh, people, especially the younger people, the people younger than me, uh, that were into the the music scene, were not seen as uh, as politically as serious as some of the other people that did the, the local and international uh, coverage. And of course, their receiver here was just wild. He was wonderful. He he did the downtown. I did the downtown route as part of my circulation duties, and uh, he he did that route with me. It was a very tough route, driving around in our little Volkswagens, getting out, and putting putting uh, newspapers on in bird boxes, or running into little uh, newsstand stores, and he would give me art history lessons as we drove around town. So uh, he told me all about the the Cubists and the. <laughs> In the realist painters of the different periods, he, he claimed to know all about Picasso. And he would just go on and on. It was a, it was a, it was really rewarding for me to be around him. Uh, we had a character come in. Uh, you might be familiar with him, Mike Malloy. He was a leftist talk show radio host uh, of some renown. He, he came, uh, he wanted, to, he came in through Ward, if I remember correctly. Uh, Ward Silver, um, uh, and um, he wanted to run a little story, a, a serial novel that he was writing called The Last Rock Festival. So he started off, I mean, it went on, I guess it went on for 12 or 15 issues. I've Ward, seen this, yeah. Ward and, uh, Ward and J.D. and Steve defended him, but as, t as it went on, people felt it had no, I guess, the political or cultural significance, um, and uh, the the, the the staff eventually, this was one of the few times I saw something actually get censored, they actually cut him off at the end. Some, some of the content he had just did not suit some people, and I guess they felt that the space was too valuable. I felt terrible, and despite the fact that he, <laughs> that he was censored, and Mike Malloy went ahead and organized a rock festival um, at uh, Chastain Park that raised several thousand dollars for the bird. One of the one of the few events, one of the events we had that kept us going on a little bit longer. Uh, I think one of the other, uh, Tom Helk held, held a dinner for us. Connie Curry, both uh, uh, activists on the civil rights, uh, 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 Atlanta, uh, I guess liberal elite communities, you know, held events for us to raise money. Krista was always very involved in getting those things going. So that was, uh, it was always a little awkward for me because I, you know, I truly wanted a, a, a socialist revolution, yet at the same time I had a, a really warm uh, spot in my heart for these uh, cultural enthusiasts mm. that may not uh, really toe a, a hard political line. And also, you know, I like vegetarianism, I like my granola, and, uh, and, I, and I was very concerned about environmental issues, uh, uh, pollution, uh, 
deforestation, uh, wildlife. All of which the bird was also we, covering. We, you know, we you saw a lot stronger coverage of that in the 84, 85 edition. Mm. At that time, there, uh, de well, definitely pollution issues uh, were covered. I, I'm, I'm trying to think, I mean, did, did we get into environmental racism in the 70s? I, not environmental. I'm not, even sure, I'm not even sure that term had been coined yet. Yeah, and I, I don't recall coverage of... But, of that, but definitely of the environment, like I, there yeah. were certainly well, articles I mean, on well, Neil and, polluted streams yeah. and right, um, um, and um, also recipes for vegetarian cooking. That's true. And, that's true. Um, I, that, a lot of that was, especially before I got there. I guess by the time there had been some sort of, of uh, I don't know, yeah, evolution during that. I, I felt, at least I felt a little bit uh, a wary of, of pushing those topics too strong. Mm. Uh, so, anyway, why don't we stop it now? <laughs> yeah, perfect. So we will, we will stop for today and then schedule part two, um, sure. hopefully just shortly. Yeah.